he said, well, if I'm not going to have you, nobody's going to have you. My heart don't understand. You know, my whole life, as I know it, has to change again if he's released. Marcus slipped a note to Trella and said, I want to talk to you one last time. Marcus left campus and he went home and he took a multitude of knives out of his mom's kitchen and he put them in his backpack. When he met her, he said, you have one last chance to take me back. And she said, no, we've already talked about it. I'm not going to continue to see you. And he said, well, if I'm not going to have you, nobody's going to have you. And he reached back into his backpack and he pulled out the butcher knife. She collapsed face up at the bottom of the stairs and the bell rang. One of my English language learners named Jorge burst into my room and he is screaming and he gets me to the stop of the top of the stairwell and he points down and says, Miss Connor, Trella. The school resource officer said, do you have any idea who could have done this? I said, yes, Marcus McTeer. He said, how do you know? I said, she broke up with him today. She was in my room today. She told me she broke up with him. She was still breathing and I would tell her anything I could think of. What do you say? And I would tell her, I'm still here. I'm still right here. It's Miss Connor. I'm sitting right here with you and I need you to stay with me. You hear me? You hear me? And her eyelids would flutter a little, but then she would just very raspy breathing. And Jackie was holding her hand and had her pulse. And, um, and I just remember saying her name over and over, Trella, 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 you gotta stay, you gotta stay, you gotta stay, keep breathing, baby, keep breathing, take another breath, baby, keep breathing. And there were all those defensive wounds I could see on her arm. And I just held her hand in both of my hands. And I just said, baby, you've got to stay with me. And Jackie said, Miss Connor, I think we've lost her. And I remember a couple of police officers saying, man, you need to back up, ma'am, back up. And they're pulling Jackie away. And, and I remember saying, no, I'm the only person here who knows her name, who knows who she is. I know her, she's mine, she's one of mine. And as they pulled me back, I heard this scream and I looked up the stairs and there was Marcus. I could see his silhouette and I realized he was holding a knife. He took the knife and he slit his own throat and then he held his hands up. It was horrendous. And that night, Carolyn called me and she said, did my baby have any last words? And I said, no, ma'am, she didn't. She wasn't able to talk. And she said, were you with her? And I said, yes, ma'am. I sat and held her, held her hand. Yes, ma'am. She said, my baby didn't die alone. I said, no, ma'am, she did not. And she said, well, I choose to believe that God put you there so my baby wouldn't die alone. And it had to be you, Miss Connor. All of the details started to come to light. Miss Carolyn found holes punched in the wall of her bedroom that she'd covered up where he had lost his temper. 
and we realized that there had been a cycle of violence in that relationship that we hadn't been aware of. She thought she could handle it, but she couldn't, you know. And I made it my mission not only that she wouldn't be forgotten, but more importantly, that there would be no other Trella Mosley's and Marcus McTeers. And I told her story again and again and again to literally thousands of kids. And not a single time, not once, did I tell her story and not have a child come forward and say, I need help. People can call me crazy if they want. They can say she's imagining whatever. But see, watch my dress. She um, blows on me. I can truly feel it. Because it's so refreshing. So refreshing. And just like that's all I have left. She came to me one day and she said, I'm a butterfly. And she said, do you understand the butterfly mama? And I said, all I know is they pretty. She said, no mama, they are not always pretty. She said, they come out as ugly little caterpillars. They're swimming around. I said, well, why would you say you a butterfly? She said, because everybody have flowers. I said, now nah, I love butterflies. She said, that's me. The metamorphosis and the growth and the outcome of a butterfly is the definition of a Trello Mosley. They don't hurt nothing. They're always supplying. They're always helping out. They're always doing something. They do have a job in this world, but their job is quiet. And that was Trello. I was told I was loaned an angel. That explained a lot. But even though it explained a lot, my heart don't understand. Knowing that so many others now have resources and guidance and help, places to go, numbers to call, That's the breath. Mm. Amazing. Understanding the signs. Now it's being talked about. That's amazing. That's amazing. Has to be talked about. Mm -hmm. Not just do we need to have this. Oh yeah, look at the law. And that's where my strength is moving in the movement and getting it done. That's the whatever it takes. That's the me saying 20 years ago, I'm going to make it to the president if I have to. Those are the promises kept. Those are the promises that have paid the way and helped. I just really need for him to spend at least that whole 40 years. At least give Charlo 40 years of his life. Like I said to him, no, I don't hate you. Mm -mm. I don't hate you because that love you're talking about you killed for still stands. But on top of that, I forgive you. God forgive me every day, forgive each one of us every day for things that we do and that we don't even know we're doing. I have to forgive you. And I'm not doing it because I have to. I'm doing it because I'm doing it. I forgive you, but wait, I'll never forget what you've done. I can't forget what you've done. 20 years later, here I am. So I really need for you to suffer as long as I'm suffering. Here we are 20 years down the road and I'm still having to have live in fear of what's gonna happen next. Marcus was like really a popular guy and I knew who he was. We were pretty much inseparable from the time that we met until later yeah. when things became different. I went to 
where I was just covered up completely and no makeup and didn't really care about how I looked at all and didn't talk to anybody but him. Like there was, I was kind of isolated to where he was my only friend. When he drastically changed is when my mom got involved. This, the term breakup was traumatic to him. And that's when he showed me a different, a totally different side of who he was. That's where he began to get physically um, abusive to me, mm -hmm. to where he would just, it started with little things like just pulling me on my backpack. If I was trying to get away from him, he would just, you know, kind of jerk me around. And it certainly, you know, started to progress where he would actually hit me or bite me. The day that he pushed me down the stairs is the day that I, I went to my teacher and I said, I have a cell phone in my backpack. Can I call my mom? You know, I want, I want to tell her what just happened to me. I, he just pushed me down the stairs and she was very supportive. She was like, yeah, go outside, call her. They had an officer on campus and we told him everything that happened and they didn't believe me. And he would leave messages. He would call my mom at work. He would stand outside our house. One morning he told me, he was like, I had a dream last night and I thought about hurting you. And in my mind, I could see you there bleeding and I had to shake it. And I remember at that point thinking, this guy wants to hurt me. He tried to kidnap my, my brother. From, he, my brother was in an elementary school in Austin. He went in and said he was my brother's stepdad and um, he needed to check him out of school. So he went as far as he was, if, he, if he wasn't gonna get me, he would you know, go to my brother. My mom contacted the city police and it was basically like they were up against a wall too. If, if he didn't hurt me, I couldn't have a protective order. Every day I would have to go to school and just be there with him and either pretend that I was, you know, okay with him that day to satisfy him or deal with him. You know, what was he gonna do to me that day? Until finally it got so intense that my, my parents, we moved, we moved a, across Austin to a different school district. We didn't tell anybody where we were going, anything like that. They just withdrew me from school. We went, I started a new high school, started a new life, basically. Didn't talk to him anymore. And that was six months from the day we left is when he killed Artrella. And then there's that, that little voice in the back of your mind that like, it could have been me. Like literally six months ago, I escaped this. And so it was a lot to take in for me at, at, that, at, at a young age, a lot to process that he had actually did that and that, you know, her, she had actually lost her life. And that the things that he was saying to me, like I, I dreamed of hurting you and I saw you there, like they weren't, he wasn't, he was being serious when he said those things. I basically was just, went from out to outreach so fast that I really didn't heal. I would speak and then totally break down because I had never really healed from what had happened to me. It was just basically, it went from, it wasn't about me anymore. You know, like I didn't even care what I had been through anymore at, for, at that point. I, it was totally all about her not dying in vain. Like help, us helping somebody because of what she went through. I don't feel like he should have the chance that she never got. You know, my whole life, as I know it, has to change again if he's released. And that's just for being protective of myself. You know, like, it's, he's given me reason to still be afraid that he would try to, you know, contact me. And even though I forgive him, it doesn't mean that I won't fight to keep him in there. Because that's part of my forgiveness is like, hey, I forgive you, but you need to take what you did. and. And this is the, if they said 40 years, you need to have your 40 years. He wants relationships still. He wants friendship. And that's just something that I can't give because I have to protect me and mine. I've had to tell my kids, hey, this might happen. If this guy gets out, we'll have to change everything. If he shows up on our doorstep, how fast are we gonna move? What are we gonna do? The, what makes me on guard is that there has been interaction that he's tried to contact us and so, or me, and so I just don't feel like, I feel like he's been that bold now, what will freedom give him? And the scary thing to me is whenever he went in, we were kids and I've grown up and moved on, but he hasn't, he's still kind of there, you know, like stuck in that time. 
And so I'm um, basically me and Trello were all he knew, you know, and and she's not here. So the other person is me. What's he gonna do? How's he gonna act? You know, I'm just praying that he doesn't make parole.